Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. The dark side of the podcast. I'm sure you were probably expecting a little grill in JR, but that's tomorrow. We figured since we're all quarantined, why not talk about our favorite new wrestling show? Of course, we're talking about dark side of the ring season two. It's brought to you by vice every single Tuesday night at 10 PM. Check your local listings. But last night, woo, we had quite the episode. I'm excited to talk about it, but I couldn't do that without the creators of the show, Jason and Evan, but Evan today, we've got a special guest. It's not just a, a, th a triple threat. It's a fatal four way. Who do we have with us today? That is right. Um, we, uh, have our story producer, Howard Sheffman here joining us for this special episode on Herb Abrams. Say hello, Howard. Hello everyone. Hi. He's also our secret weapon. I would say, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'll take it. <laughs> Howard uh, has been with us since season one uh, of the show, and um, he is definitely a vital part of producing the show. He uh, does a lot of the research. He he reaches out to a lot of the subjects. He helps us through legal turmoils. He 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 uh, he instills us with passion. He holds he us together. He keeps us on the schedule. Any of the times where we actually think about quitting, he brings us back. <laughs> um, so yeah, Howard is a, is a, is a, is a vital part of the show. Uh, and so, but the main reason we wanted to have him on this week is because, uh, because Howard actually, um, really was the, the mastermind behind this episode. And we basically tasked him with, you know, um, like, r like running with the Herb Abrams ball, uh, uh, if you will. And so he went really deep in terms of talking to all the subjects you see on screen, Tons of subjects you see that did that 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 weren't interviewed and did all the research, put it all together so we could tackle this episode. And I would say that her uh, Howard, I see I'm gonna call you Herb because it's just now it's oh it's happened. It has blurred. been a lot of people keep calling me Herb now. It's it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, Howard, um, I think might be the single handedly the most knowledgeable person on the Herb Abrams story that's uh, uh, alive, that, that's still alive. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so that's why we thought bringing him on the show this week would help, um, you know, tell tons of different stories about the making of this uh, Gonzo uh, episode of the show. Well, Evan, let's start at the beginning. How did we land on the decision to do a UWF story in the first place? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, so in the very beginning of the dark side of the ring saga, when Jason and I were pitching this show and putting it together, developing it, um, I decided to reach out to, um, a bunch of different wrestling historians, wrestling people like in the, in the community who've done lots of interviews with other wrestlers prior, just because I wanted to find out 
what were the most insane stories out there that we could tell for the show. And when I was putting this all together, I, I reached out to Sean Oliver, who is the fellow behind Kayfabe Commentaries, mainly because Jason and I had been a fan of those Kayfabe Commentary DVDs. We bought so okay. many of them yeah. and yeah, watched them and took notes and were inspired by a lot of the crazy road stories that have come up on those in the past. So I just figured that, you know, Sean must have heard some crazy stories in his time talking to all these guys. And what would his suggestion be if we were to do this documentary series about wrestling? And the one that he basically the only story that he really provided um, and, and was very rather insistent upon it was the story of Herb Abrams and and the UWF. And I, ha I have to be honest, I'd never heard of any of it before. It was totally a blind spot in my wrestling fandom. And so basically, you know, he 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 obviously led with the story of Herb Abrams death. Like, how could you forget that? And um, and 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 I and I actually put the Herb Abrams story as a as a potential uh, subject that we could cover if the series were to get greenlit. So it was actually in the original pitch deck, pitch materials for the show. And once we then were off to the races making the Bruiser Brody episode, and once we were uh, making season one, for whatever reason, we didn't. We didn't make it. We didn't make the Herb episode. I don't know why. I don't really have a good answer for that, to be honest I with you. I think, honestly, it was because, like, at the time, it was, like, the story that we just couldn't find out anything about. Like, Well, that's with true. Every, with every one of our episodes, we do our own, like, preliminary, like, research on it. Um, and it, that, I feel like there just wasn't, like, enough information for us to really, like, sink our teeth into as much as the other stories at that time. That's true. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't a lot of information out there on the internet. And I feel like once we got wrapped up in season one and we were just kind of like, because this is really the, one of the first times we had signed up to do something so, you know, intense, you know, and, and making making six documentaries at the same time that I don't think there was a lot of room for us to like stop and research something like that, like as, as much heavy lifting that needed at the time. So long story short, we finished season one and Sean Oliver actually asked me to be on his podcast um, just to, you know, interview, talk to me about making season one. And I went on there and I think the whole reason I was on the show was just so he could actually grill me about why we didn't do the Herb Abrams story for season one. Like I, <laughs> I like you had one job, you know, you had one job. I told you what it should have been and you didn't do it. Why did why didn't you do it? The world doesn't need another Montreal screw job documentary. The world needs this Herb Abrams story. What's wrong with you? And so I didn't and then and then of course in that while he was cutting the promo, he was listing all the reasons why it was such a perfect fit for Dark Side of the Ring, but also a fit for Vice. And I really couldn't argue with it. I had nothing. I I froze. I there was nothing I could really say. He was right. And at this point in time, we were just starting work on season two. And so what I did is I was like, you know, I had this nagging feeling and just like this in the pit of my stomach. And I was like, man, he's right. We really should do this because maybe there really is something here. And we were right at that time when we were kind of deciding what the episodes were going to be for season two. And I walked into the office and Howard, if you can back me up, I basically, I believe made some sort of mini announcement that we are going to officially tackle this for season two. We should at least look into it. And then you did. Uh, yeah, I'm going to actually correct you. You, It was a phone call because I, I distinctly remember. It's very funny. I remember you uh, just, I was in the office. I get a call from you and which is, you know, normal, but just like very energetic and just like, I just got off this podcast. Do you know about Herb Abrams? I have no idea what you're talking about. And you just went off about like, again, the, bones of what this story is and how yeah we have to do the story is there a story here and then that was i think that was like in the fall and then basically every day since then has been her abrams all the time for me <laughs> yeah every day <laughs> yeah exactly so then yeah we were off to the races well it's uh, quite a story but unfortunately it's one that i think a lot of people who watch this show probably heard for the very first time maybe that's fortunately but uh the Twitter activity we saw last night was incredible uh, with so many people hearing this story for the very first time. It, it is sort of, um, I don't know, is, is, is underground the right word or how would you describe this, uh, fantastic story of, of Herb Abrams and the, and the, 
missteps of the UWF, Evan? Yeah, so I kind of describe this story and, um, th- you know, j- just for the layman, for someone who's not as familiar with the story like I was, but I've always kind of described it as Boogie Nights, you know, meets the Fire Festival of Wrestling, where essentially you have this enigmatic, um, very impressionable, uh, charismatic individual, Herb Abrams, who is a wrestling fan at, at his heart, and... Um, he basically decides that he wants to start his own wrestling federation. Um, and he's able to actually seduce and, <laughs> and get people to subscribe to his vision and his lofty dreams of doing so. And then you have a, an impressive roster of guys, you know, uh, as we saw, you know, Paul Orndorff, Mick Foley, Dr. Death, Steve Williams, you know, heck even Andre, the giant basically subscribe to, this this dream and they're along for the ride but then everyone starts to have their 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 slow burn rude awakening of what's really going on here and oh this is a vanity project gone wild and you know checks are bouncing and audience members aren't showing up and what the hell is going on here and then obviously it concludes with the most spectacular you know, uh, outrageous passing of any individual that I've ever heard of in, in my in my time it's uh it's such a fascinating story and you mentioned you know that this is a guy who wants to start his own promotion but we hear about uh, a meeting where maybe that wasn't the original plan howard what did you learn about abram's meeting with vince mcmahon uh yeah i mean so i I, i've actually again like basically everything in this story i've heard four different versions of his meeting with vince mcmahon but the the one that seems from people I've talked to who apparently were at this meeting, Herb basically conned his way into a meeting with Vince McMahon. Like he had become with an assistant of Vince's or someone working with Vince. I'm not sure exactly who that was. And Herb got this meeting and he sits down and Vince basically says, so what are you here for? And Herb tries to sell himself. He tries to sell like wrestling and he wants to take over the West coast and he'll do this and he'll do that. And again, from a close friend of Herb's, he he told me that this was probably the only person who Herb ever came across who didn't buy Herb's stick. Like the (laughs) only guy who didn't fall for Herb's charm is Vince McMahon, which I love. Yeah. (laughs) That's a story in and of itself. And you know, it doesn't go well. And so I sort of wonder Jason, I think me and you've talked about this before, but you're a fan of Curb Your Enthusiasm, right? Mm, I don't know if we've talked about that before. <laughs> How could you not be? First of all, well, that's, yeah, come on. Uh, that's what I'm I don't, saying. Yeah. Well, so here's I, I, the deal. I have I a may, theory. I, I may have only seen a couple episodes of that show, to be honest. Well, this past season, they had an episode, or I guess the whole theme was Larry being upset at another business. And he opened up a spite store right next door. I feel like the UWF is Herb Abrams spite store for Vince McMahon. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. And when you see like the, like the lengths in which he went to, to try and I, I think like kind of stick it to Vince McMahon, like we highlight a, a couple of them and they're, they're very inspirational. There's just, so many more like yeah. uh, just one I'll throw out there is, um, uh, I've been told that Herb would call or fax Titan Sports with offers to buy the WWF. Like, <laughs> he, he had, that was not going to happen. It was not an actual, it was just that he wanted Vince McMahon to see that someone was trying to buy it, and it was Herb Abrams. Like, he would do anything just to, like, rattle Vince. And, and, and John says it in the episode. John Arizzi says, like, pretty much just for his own enjoyment, this, like, sick fun of his. Yeah, and like uh, one thing I was going to throw on to that, like you can kind of like I'm actually asking you this, Howard, but like is it is it sort of safe to say that like because he was shut out from Vince, you know, because Vince didn't entertain his his lofty vision that essentially that started the trajectory of her being on this kind of, you know, this like this like this like forward momentum with with really trying to crush and put, you know, Vince out of business. Isn't that safe to say? Yeah, it it does. It seems like that. It seems like if Vince had been had seen something in Herb and saw potential in him, we could have seen a like a, a new flunky for Vince McMahon. Like it could have been a whole different story. Because at the end of the day, Herb charmed 
so many people. There are like from the most like powerful people you've ever heard of to people on the street. Herb was charming to all of them. And if if that had worked with Vince, I think we would have been telling a very different story here. Wow. It's such a character. And one of the other things, my favorite, one of my favorite things in the show period was the explanation of how the, the belt worked, uh, with regards to the, the side plates, Evan, what can you tell us about this? <laughs> the belt is amazing. Um, what you're, what, how, uh, Conrad's referring to is the sports channel America belt that we all saw last night, you know, that says F you when you hold it up, <laughs> which is kind of is amazing. Cause it really shows, um, you know, Herb's sense of humor, which I think is, is, is kind of undersold throughout the story. Uh, not only within the, the, what that belt represented, but also the fact that his dog's name is Koki. I also figure out is pretty hilarious, but anyway, um, one of the amazing things about the UWF is just the sheer number of belts that they actually had. It was something that we didn't actually have the runtime to get into last night, but Howard, aren't you like a, a scholar on the number of <laughs> UWF belts that are out there? Uh, and, and this is the thing. We have the line where just Herb loved belts. He loved designing them. He loved getting them made. He And, and there's a bunch around there, like Rick uh, Allen, Sonny Beach. He has, I think, two of them. There's a few people kind of scattered around. Like Lenny has the Sports Channel America belt, and these are kind of everywhere. Um, but yeah, there's the uh, there was the UWF America's Championship. There was the UWF Intercontinental Heavyweight Championship. We can all remember the UWF Israeli Championship that uh, went to Joshua Ben-Gurion. Um, the UWF Junior Heavyweight Championship, the UWF MGM Grand Championship, the UWF Midget World Championship, the UWF North American Championship, the UWF Southern States Championship, the UWF Sports Channel Television Championship, the U UWF World <laughs> Women's World Championship, the UWF World Heavyweight Championship, and finally, the UWF World Tag Team Championship. And again, this is a promotion that lasted like one full year and then maybe three or four events after that. It's pretty remarkable. And Rick Allen has the has the world midget championship as well, which I which I've seen, which I have a photograph of, which oh is in God. incredible. Well, let's talk about, you know, the you refer to it as the sports channel belt. Uh it, you actually wound up talking to a lot of folks who didn't make the final cut here, Howard, including some folks from the TV station, right? Yeah, I, I talked to a number of guys who were like heavily involved from the network up until like to the point of like they were the guys who were in the arena, not arena, the, <laughs> the, the small spaces with her when they were actually filming the matches. And it, it's just wild. Like they loved him. They, again, it's that charm. Every guy I talked to would say, yeah, he stiffed me. Yeah, he like that money went away quickly, but he was so great. And uh, uh, one guy I spoke to, his name is Michael Lardner, and he was the senior VP executive producer at Sports Channel America. And he remember he Herb came into the pitch meeting with Paul Orndorff and he sold them on the big names that he'd bring, be bringing in. And like it was just Herb would get in a room and you would just want to give give him your money. Um and he also remembered the cookies. A lot of those guys remember the cookies. That that's for sure. Did we ever get confirmation that the cookies were like like something you know on the open market you could buy and you could actually you could actually purchase, or were they just kind of proof of concept at the time? Uh, I am gonna say probably proof of concept because the only people who ever can say that they had them are kind of the network guys who they they remember getting the the boxes mailed and like again rave reviews. Michael Lardner and his wife both <laughs> remember the cookies and were uh, that was a, a one of the fonder memories of the of their time with her. But but yeah, those Sports Channel people that to them it was a small investment. They were kind of a growing like cable network and uh, they wanted wrestling and Herb. I mean, there was a couple other people who had potential to be in that spot and Herb sold them with Paul Orndorff with uh, uh, um, just all those kind of big names he was working with at the time and got connected to. Speak, hmm. Speaking of big names, Evan, you guys had one of the biggest names in the history of the business. who was also a part of the UWF participate in this, the former cactus Jack friend of the program, Mick Foley. What was it like working with Mick this season? Well, it was just great having Mick back. I mean, you know, we worked with Mick on the on the the Bruiser Brody pilot 
um, who was just an amazing collaborator because, you know, Mick was chosen to narrate that episode because of his personal, you know, connection to Bruiser Brody. He idolized Bruiser Brody. And, you know, Mick was just so involved in like the writing of that narration. And uh, he took every word that we wrote and made it better. And he was just so awesome to work with him. Um, and it was such a great experience that Jason and I had. And we were really hoping to find an, like another way to, to, to work together. And it was when this idea of doing the UWF episode came about, it was like, well, maybe, you know, we can ask Mick and maybe, maybe he'll say yes, maybe he'll want to do this. And I, I really had no idea what like Mick's take was on this whole story. And so I wrote him an email and just kind of saying like pitching the idea and he wrote me back instantaneously and was like, yes, I'm in. And then we were really off to the races then when, you know, we had Mick uh, be a part of this and, as you saw in the episode last night, he's so funny. And Mick had some of the more memorable lines of the whole season, in my opinion. And it was really cool just to hear his perspective because I think he he adds so much to the episode in terms of like, you know, the fact that he attributes his time period in the UWF as that real kind of experimental phase in his career where, you know, because he wasn't wrestling, you know, um, like, as he says, with handcuffs on as he was in WCW, UWF, probably mainly because of some of the naivete and that it was a smaller company, they didn't have a lot of creative control over their wrestlers. So it let people like Mick really kind of find themselves. And, and I think he really found, um, you know, a lot of creative freedom in developing that Cactus Jack character and 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 some of the other fo faces of Foley that he would go on to portray. And I think he really attributes that to the time he had in UWF where he had so much freedom, which is just amazing that there's such a net positive to have out of this whole crazy nightmare that is uh, the UWF. How, Howard, what do you make of the... I mean, the way people talk about Herb is almost like, yeah, he was full of shit, but we love him. I mean, it, it feels like there's some really... Uh, I don't know, nasty stories here to be told that that aren't exactly glowing or positive or productive. Uh, it just feels like a lot of bad, but when people talk about him, they talk about him so lovingly. Is that what you discovered when you interviewed most folks for this? Uh, I want to say that the, one of the challenges of this episode was properly like getting to the audience, like how the wrestling isn't really good and how much of a shit show the whole thing was just because we talked to a ton of people and it was hard for that. Even Mick Foley, who's like, he obviously went on to become one of the greatest of all times. And like to get them to talk poorly about this promotion that like, if you want to watch, it's all online and it's not great. It's, it's unquestionably a lot of bad wrestling and production go went into that. And these guys had nothing but good things to say about him. Like like one major thing about this episode that I think we tried to show is how all these guys, they thought they were close to Herb and, and maybe they were briefly, but, but ultimately he was scanning them, scamming them one way or another. And, and when I say scamming, it's in a weird way. He's like, wasn't always hurting people for, for some, he was clearly keeping elements of his life and his past close to the vest and um, I think, I mean, sorry to jump ahead, but I think it's one of the reasons why everyone's story about his death is different. And it's why people in the episode still think that he could be alive. Like he just, he convinced people that they were going to the top with him. And even when they didn't go to the top, they didn't hold it against him. And that's a weird quality that I don't think many people have. Well, yeah, I was just going to throw onto that too, is it's like, it's really interesting, something that, I didn't expect when we were filming these interviews is, you know, you it, like, you, you know, going in that, you know, her bounce checks on these guys, you know, that they, that they weren't always paid. They weren't settled. They're still owed money, you know, and all this stuff. And normally in the wrestling industry, like in the wrestling industry or any other industry that's met with malice or bitterment, you know, people are, people would hold on to that. I feel like, but with him, with Herb and it's like, most of these guys have have experienced bounce checks from Herb, but at the same time, for the most part, they're still very emotional about his death, and they and 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 they were really endeared by this guy, and they still like this guy, and like you know, even though all these crazy shady things went down, um, it's like even Brian Blair mentions, which is I think is something we should we should get into because we didn't really have the runtime for it in the episode, is to kind of talk about. Um, 
the, you know, where does the money come from in this situation? Right. Um, and like even Brian Blair, who introduced, um, a, a financier into this equation, like he actually introduced, I think it was a friend of his, right, Howard, yeah, who, yeah. yeah, it was like a friend of his who had some money to invest and he put some money into UWF, Herb sold him on it. And then here comes some, you know, uh, here comes cash from this guy. And of course, right after that, Brian Blair is seeing, you know, effectively all this go up his nose, you know, <laughs> like he's seeing, he's seeing the, uh, the uh, cocaine, he's seeing the hookers. He's also seeing, you know, checks bounce. And, uh, he's also seeing Herb take people out for these enormous dinners and paying for all this booze and everything. And, you know, Brian's just sitting there knowing that this is all, you know, coming from his buddy's paycheck or sorry, his, his buddy's wallet. And it's like, oh, my God, you know, and so it's like but even then Brian gets emotional talking about Herb's passing and considers Herb a close friend. And, and, you know, and Brian, sorry, and, and Brian has the line in the episode of, of he it was other people's money. But if it was still if it was his money, I think he still would do the same. And I feel like that encapsulates right. how they think about Herb. Exactly. So th I think all of this is just really indicative of the fact that, you know, Herb's charm, you know, runs deep. Talk to me a little bit about that because, you know, the, the, the only line that we know it's not his own money, because it's sort of alluded to that it really was his own money because he made plus side dresses or plus size dresses. <laughs> and, and I sort of bought into that, but then you hear Brian Blair say, no, it was other people's money. When did, when did, uh, herbs money stop and investor money begin? Do you know, Howard, it, like everything herb, I've heard 400 versions of it. It, it really seems I, I talked to a close friend, like a really close friend of Herb's uh, near the end of this whole process who really explored a lot of the stuff that of, like kind of about Herb's early days and the, the oversized women, women's clothing. I'm a big girl. Now that store was one of 14 stores that Herb had in his time. And he, he had like, it was all clothing stores and they were in New York, they were LA and he would open one. He'd close one. He'd have money. He wouldn't have money. And like, Herb's charm got him investors, and the one Brian spoke to us about is one of them. And starting the UWF, he got from other money from other people. He got some from Sports Channel America. But like, uh, th was there a time when the UWF was funded by Herb Abrams himself? It's possible, but I would not. <laughs> I wouldn't put money on it. Well, the other thing too you hear about in the episode that's also kind of on this subject is when. You know Marty's story um, when they when they're running the show in North Dakota, right? Is that wasn't that where it is or South Carolina? North so, sorry, yeah, right. When they're running the show in South Carolina and the TV crew is expecting to get paid, and then you know Herb puts them on the phone, you know, and, and has them talk to the bank of you know with his personal banking information, saying that there's money there, but when in fact the bank account that he's writing the check with, which is the UWF money, there's nothing there. So. That's also touched on a little bit as well. And, um, you know, I, from, from what I recall too, and maybe I'm just speculating, but, um, that, you know, that Herb, you know, kind of got this thing rolling with the money that he had from, mm -hmm. I'm a big girl now. And then I think as it was running its course and maybe as he had these different stops and starts, you know, with when the sports channel deal, you know, was over because that, that was only a year long contract. Right. Yep. And then he goes into these other kind of relaunching UWFs. He's probably bringing on other investors and selling them in it. And I do also remember from the Brian Blair thing, too, that it was like his his his, his family friend that was investing in the UWF. And I think it was like his son, like this guy's son was kind of managing the money like as it was being like sent to Herb. And don't quote me on this. I'm just recalling this from the interview. But then it was like this guy found out that his son was giving Herb like way more money. Than I think it was his brother. His brother. Right. Okay. Sorry. His brother. Yeah. It was like was actually green lighting, giving Herb way more money than this guy thought he had even agreed to in the beginning. And then you kind of wonder like, oh, my gosh, like this money. I mean, you see in the episode where this money is probably actually going. And I think that was a huge source of, uh, 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 I think it even caused that family to kind of be torn apart a little bit. Right. Didn't he get divorced yeah. over that whole thing or so? Yeah. So there, there was definitely some, some, some stuff that happened there that was definitely not good. That was no bueno. And, and sir, that just reminded me there is, so Herb definitely did have money at some point. 
uh, th- there is rumor. A lot of people said it might. He he was married to a woman uh, for a while who they thought it might have been her money because he. Everyone talks about when they first met, meeting her when he was in L.A. He was living in Beverly Hills, like in a beautiful house. He drove a fancy car. So, what that money was from, we still don't know. But he, yeah, there definitely was a point in which he had money and was very happy to show it off. Um, but yeah, wh- where that went or how he got it will remain a mystery. Herb, if this was a, I mean, Howard, if this was an American Greed episode about Herb, we would have some sort of tally. Do you have any (laughs) sort of idea how much money he lost on this venture? Uh, I I don't think you could. Like, it's just, he ran, he, like, the promotion was announced in 1990. He started running shows in Los Angeles in the early nine or the late 90s. Yeah, into 91 where he goes to New York and then he does shows in Florida. He does one in North Dakota, one in um, in South Carolina, and he does the Blackjack Brawl in Las Vegas. And like it, it just it, none of those shows made money for him. And so and to end it all on the Blackjack Brawl at the MGM Grand, like that alone who knows how much he personally lost there. So th- there'll be, no- yeah, it is just lost to time. Unfortunately, let's talk about blackjack brawl. One of the more, uh, iconic shows, uh, of its sort. And one of the things that he pulls off before we talk about the MGM grand is, and Jason help me out here. Allegedly he got an appearance for Dr. Death on the tonight show with Jay Leno to promote this pay-per-view and I've never seen footage of that. I mean, is this rumor in innuendo? Did this actually happen? I can't recall, Howard. Do you know if there was footage of that? Oh, I know. I spent uh, a couple <laughs> of weeks. Oh, no, that that that's my white whale. I'll, I'm going to put anyone listening to this podcast. If you can find me that clip, I will owe you forever. Because um, I, I it happened. Basically, what the bit is, is Dr. Death. Uh, it's like a Jay Leno was shooting in Las Vegas. And... Um, in one of the episodes from that that that's that week, uh, Doctor Death is in the audience and challenges Jay to a match, and they kind of growl at each other. And then uh, I believe Doctor Death challenges Hulk Hogan to a match. It's kind of just uh, twenty seconds of of uh, footage, but um, uh, long story short, uh, NBC refused to find us the material i was able to give them the date it happened i gave a an explanation of what the moment would be and they if we weren't able to physically show them what we wanted they wouldn't find it for us um and it doesn't exist online and you'd be surprised to find out there aren't a lot of uh jay leno uh uh internet fans so that did that didn't help us either <laughs> Um, somebody, but then somebody oh, somewhere has a collection of tonight show vhs's i'm i'm just sure of it I, I've talked to tape like I, uh, there was a tape trader who was involved in the show who like he's really in that world. He's found some really interesting wrestling things and other stuff. And I asked him to ask the community and and nothing came back on that. Um, but one thing about that appearance I, I want to mention is Steve Ray, who's a pretty big standout in the episode. He he tells me the reason that happened is he was and this is the one the number one scene I wanted to make a recreation of that we didn't get to do is. He was in an elevator in Las Vegas, and uh, he sees Jay Leno in the elevator, and he starts pitching about Herb and about the UWF and this uh, um, this, this pay per view or this not not a pay per view this event, and Jay gives him his card, and then in the hotel room, him and Doctor Death flip a coin of who gets to appear on the show, and Doctor Death wins. And I, I I really wanted to just show that meeting on the elevator as like we just see the chin in shadows. Oh. <laughs> That's it's funny. like I guess like Lenny who worked at NBC as like a post production like wasn't he the head of post production at NBC for twenty five years? They wouldn't something even like let that. Him have access to something like that. That's fine. Well, so uh, I, again, we don't talk about it too much in the episode, but uh, Lenny wasn't involved at the time of the blackjack brawl. Like he was, that was a time when he he had given Herb kind of an ultimatum where you have to get clean or I can't work for you anymore. And the blackjack brawl was one of maybe two events uh, alongside the North Dakota show that Lenny was not involved in at all. So he, maybe he does have a copy somewhere, but uh, yeah, NBC nowadays, they do not want to give it to us. And Lenny is a fascinating character, like in the whole, you know, UWF story and, 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 and trajectory because, you know, Lenny's the straight man, right? Like Lenny's the guy who I think constantly was having to hold this whole shit show together. 
you know, anytime that, you know, her would be off disappearing, you know, um, doing drugs and being with women and partying when he should be focusing on these events. I think that if, if it weren't for Lenny, the, the UWF wouldn't have gotten nearly as far as it did. And, uh, it was just like such an amazing thing for us to get Lenny to, um, appear in the episode because I think he adds so much to this story. Um, and, and again, it's like, again, like another emotional voice too. I mean, this is a guy who collaborated with Herb. He, he considers him a best friend and, you know, he was torn up about his passing too. And, you know, he was really up front right in the beginning of the interview saying like all the things you read about Herb and all the stuff you hear about his death and like the, the, like the, like tabloid nature of it all. Like, you know, it's true, but you know, I want to tell you about the Herb that I knew, you know, and he had a whole nother side to, to this, you know, that, that like he was a generous person and, you know, they, they were really close as friends, but you know, Lenny was a guy who constantly, I think had to drag Herb out of these wild situations, these wild party situations, smack him around, you know, a little bit and, and, and get him to sober up so they could, they could, they could continue this, this, this wild and crazy dream. Yeah. Lenny is very much like the, I feel like the unsung hero, or at least like, I think people will like him so much because he is that, like, he is like a good friend. Like he tries to be a good friend and he's just like, I don't know. such a great yeah. example. Even when, even when he wouldn't work for Herb, he was still calling and checking in and making sure he was okay. Like, he was that kind of guy. Like, I can't do business with you. Uh, not to be clear, uh, Lenny was never paid a dime working for Herb Abrams. That was all on his own expense and doing it because he loved Herb and wanted to get in wrestling. It's, that was the dream. And he he was there for Herb in, in any way he could until he couldn't anymore. Wow. Well, it feels like he couldn't anymore after the blackjack brawl. And when we say he, we mean Herb Abrams. This is sort of the last hurrah. What can you tell us about the blackjack brawl and how this comes to, uh, well, not the best end. <laughs> well, the one thing I'll say about the blackjack brawl is obviously, you know, I don't quote me on this, but I believe the MGM grand holds at least, you know, anywhere between 12 and 14,000 people. Right. Uh and Something to that effect. Evan, and then I can give you the exact number. So I'm uh, not surprised. I'm not surprised you can. What is uh, it? Let's just be clear. So there were 15,109 tickets printed for the Blackjack Brawl. And would you like to know how many tickets were uh, purchased? Uh, please. 640. But now, can I correct you on that? Because it wasn't, wasn't the... Isn't is this six hundred and four or whatever number based upon what Herb had reported? No, this is from the um, uh, D David Bixon span had sent us the uh, uh, Nevada State uh, Athletic Commission report for the Blackjack Brawl, which is a crazy document to look at. And this is from the official document is 640. And again, who knows how many of those Herb paid for, but there 640 you go. out of a total of 15,000 tickets that were printed for that event. So 604, but like it still could be an embellishment on how many actual butts were in seats though, right? Like 604 seems very liberal to what you see on screen. Oh yeah, for sure. And again, like most of those tickets were the $12 tickets and it, it, yeah, we, we don't know how many of those people were uh, comped and given in the casino because that's how he clearly was trying to get people to come to the event. But uh, yeah, no, it was uh, a, a disaster of, I don't think anything can compare to that. And I and I have to just include that I just love Mick Foley's, you know, like, you know, he again, like you're like, wow, Herb pulled off the MGM Grand. Maybe this is the time that we've been waiting for. Maybe he might just do it this time. And then, of course, you know, Mick's amazing story about going up to his hotel room suite. And then when, you know, Herb unveils these cowboy boots as really the most important thing of the show, then you really know you're in trouble. And I just I just love that scene. And um, one of the little uh, fun little facts about that scene is the, the actor that we had to play Mick Foley in the reenactments actually just no showed. It's one of the only times we've ever had an actor just completely no show. Yeah, on yeah us. right. Totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah. No totally no showed so we had to get jason eisner suited up to play mcfoley in that scene so yeah yeah i never thought that i would have to double <laughs> but you know you can and, <laughs> and yeah. then of course howard played uh lenny in all of the reenactment scenes that you see of lenny trying to get uh herb abrams you know uh, sober to, you're trying to get him to sober up and that was that was yeah. you 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, so fans can know, I tried to get into every episode I could. I think I'm in like four or five. But yeah, if I had it my way, I would have played John Stossel. I would have played, uh, I mean, I played Earl Hebner in season one. I mean, trust me, I, I was working real hard to get my face there. Yeah, we had you, you played a referee in a lot of episodes too. Well, Earl yeah. Hebner, yeah. No, yeah. but I also, I'm the referee in Dino Bravo. I'm the referee in uh, Brawl for All. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I am nothing but not wanting to be on camera. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, just, uh, two, I just want to add a couple more blackjack brawl things we couldn't get in the episode. Um, one thing that Evan, you might have not realized that when you did those interviews, I think every single person, uh, referred to the blackjack brawl as a pay-per-view, uh, and it is not, it was on sports channel America, free cable. It was never a pay-per-view, but because like, who who else who in the right mind would put an event at the MGM Grand uh, on free cable? None of these guys twenty five years later realize that this was just um, available for anyone to watch. And then the kicker on that is that the people, if you were one of the five hundred people who wanted to watch the Blackjack Brawl at home, uh, you couldn't for the first ten minutes because it was preempted for a preseason hockey game on Sports Channel. So if you look on YouTube, there's a version of the Blackjack Brawl that is the original taped from when it uh, it aired. And that version, you can see them interrupting mid-match as like, we join you in uh, the process of the Blackjack Brawl. <laughs> Amazing. Well, let's talk about, uh, you know, we've talked about some of the folks who were in the business. What about Howard the person or, or Herb the person? I'm going <laughs> to continue to do this now that Evan's put this in my head subconsciously. Uh, <laughs> Talk to me about, you know, Herb, the man, Herb, the family man. Did, did you meet any of Herb's family through the course of these interviews? Yeah. So I'll, um, I'll quickly just say I, and I was able to track down first of all, Herb's, uh, one of Herb's wives. So Herb had two wives and one of them that all the guys talk about, I was able to track her down. I gave her a phone call and I think in the history of this show, it was the fastest, uh, hang up I've received in two <laughs> seasons. It was like. I'm doing this documentary. It's about Herb Abrams. I believe you were married to him. Click. End of conversation. <laughs> um, but uh, the main thing about this is so far, I, I, Evan and Jason have talked about this, but for our show, we really like to talk about, like, we like to talk to family members and the people who are affected by these crazy events outside of professional wrestling. And and for Herb, um, again, because he's sort of a mystery in the wrestling world and he died before the internet really took off, there isn't too much information about that side of him and we were able to um through uh, i'm just going to mention there's a guy named jonathan plompton who is writing a book he's been writing a book for maybe like 10 years at this point about herb abrams and he's truly the like herb abrams guy and he put me in touch with uh, a cousin of herbs who uh we actually we ended up interviewing for the episode but didn't put it in the show and he's like really interesting and really kind of opened it up a little bit and he uh introduced me to herb's sister who's still alive and uh herb's sister is a very private woman and she it took me a long time to kind of build a relationship with her and get her to kind of understand what we're trying to tell with this story and just try to learn more about herb because there's just so little i knew about herb and um so I ended up being able to go visit her. I went to where she lives. I don't want to name that. Um, and I spent a few hours just talking with her sister. And to me, the most fascinating thing is that she had no idea about 90% of his wrestling. She knew he was in wrestling. She knew he had a promotion. But like the Blackjack Brawl, I, I was like, hey, do you remember when Herb did this? He had the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. She has no idea. N never heard of that forever before. And he, he definitely kept that part private. But um, like everyone else, they Herb scammed his family. And um, his sister, uh, Herb, stole her identity. And it took her years afterwards to be able to deal with credit card companies and the IRS because he – he was able to make credit cards in her in his in her name and then run them up. And he that like everyone else, she still loves him and thinks the world of him. But it it was very challenging for her. And um, when um, her, she mentioned to me how uh, when their uh, when after Herb died, um, they were at their mother's house, Herb's mother's house in New York for sitting shiva, which if people don't know. It's when a, a Jewish person dies, you go uh, for about a week afterwards, you'll sit in their home and visit with the family. And when they were sitting Shiva, 
uh, one of the nights, two men in suits knocked on the front door. And when they opened the front door uh, to see who these people were, these two men were very clearly like looking behind and trying to like uh, trying to just get in the house, even though they'd never known who these people were. And so her sister kind of chases them, get tells them to leave. And when um, she's trying to chase after them to get their license plate, they're out of there and just running. And uh, and basically about a week later, uh, Herb's mother's house was broken into and then it was broken into again. And uh, yeah, eventually uh, Herb's sister moved their mother out of New York because they, they're not sure who it was. They think it possibly could have been the mob, but they just knew that people were thought Herb could be alive and wanted money from him. Wow. It's uh, it's such an, a weird story because he is, uh, he's a character unlike anybody. I mean, this is such a business filled with crazy characters and it feels like he takes the cake to the point that even when he passes away, uh, there's controversy and, and I'm sure there's lots of unanswered questions and you sort of broke that down uh, on the episode with everybody has their own version of how he passed away. But the most interesting thing is the teaser that, Hey, what if he faked his own death? Uh, what do you make of all this, Evan? Well, I was going to say, yeah, like, you know, one of the things that we tried to do when we set out, you know, to make this to like, to, to make this episode was really, I mean, one of the things that you know about Herb, if you go in, like if, if, if any wrestling fans have sort of casually heard, heard about Herb Abrams, you, you've probably heard about his death. You know, so that was one of the things that definitely sold me on this being a fascinating subject for an episode of the show. But I, I, I just remember, I'm sure, Howard, you remember, like, I was really keen on us trying to figure out exactly what happened in that in that office, you know, yeah. that day in 1996. And, you know, for us, it was really tough. I mean, there are some tabloidy newspaper stories that have been written about it, but we, we but we were never really able like to verify it with any of the authorities or anything like that. Right, Howard? I mean, that's safe to say. Yeah, it, I, it seems I mean, the the best ver the article that we kind of feature for a moment in the episode is kind of the only article that seems to have been written really that says this thing happened in this office. He died uh, in the hospital. And so what seems to have happened is, yeah, everything that <laughs> happened in that office, police come, they arrest him, and either he had a heart attack in the car or at some point in the process, they bring him to the hospital and he dies. But because of that, they didn't seem to do a police report. Like I put in the paperwork. I know other people I spoke to have tried to get a police report on his passing and no one has ever come through with it. So if there is one, the New York city police don't want to share it, but it seems more likely that just nothing was written up. So it is really just hearsay and innuendo. And because I think he's such a like larger than life, you know, person and like the way he lived his life in terms of scamming people and skipping out on money and, you know, <laughs> always, always trying to find an edge no matter what. I think it's 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 opened the door for people to believe that well he's a prime candidate for someone to fake his own death right, and you know that was something that you know Marty, who's in the episode um you know um, AKA Colonel Red he's one of the first interviews we did for the episode and you know that was a huge factor for him was no this guy is still alive I know for for a fact I can feel it you know <laughs> basically, and so. You know, for us, it just it just made it even more compelling. Um, and um, I, you know, and 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 like even even the legend of this whole thing and the and the I don't even know what you want to call it, but this whole like continuation of the Herb Abrams urban legend story it has even extended on Howard. You might get mad for me, mad at me for bringing this up, but it's fine. The, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> is the idea of Herb Abrams Jr which was another um, crazy thing that just is part of this whole saga um, is there's apparently some fellow on the internet who, who, who actually goes by Herb Abrams Jr. and has reached out and contacted several of the, the folks you saw in last night's episode, basically proclaiming that he's like the illegitimate son of Herb Abrams and, and he's like now trying to put on UWF wrestling shows. But this whole thing is like basically another scam within a scam pretty much. And it's, you know, obviously been very traumatizing for the family and other people uh, involved because, you know, this, this, because as far as we know, he doesn't have any other children. He right? does. How I'm just going to be very clear. He does not. 
this person is a is a fraud, a very easily found out fraud by my 20 minutes of research. But I think it is really speaks to the legacy of Herb that someone I think Herb would love it that someone pretending to be his kid. That's like that seems like that's right up his alley. <laughs> yeah. So just it, it, the the whole rabbit hole of you know Herb Abrams and the UWF is just it's just ever evolving, even in even in the year 2020. <sighs> just you know fake signs and faking deaths. I mean, there's so much craziness surrounding this, but we saw multiple stories of guys, you know, coming in to visit urban in his, in his uh, hotel room and there being piles of cocaine and, uh, hookers. And this is probably <laughs> unlike anything else you've ever had to shoot. Right, Jason. Yeah, there was definitely like, I, I remember getting pitched some of the scenes from Howard that we're going to shoot and just being like, Oh my God, like we got to find actors that we got to like convince to do some of these things. And luckily we found someone really cool to play Herb Abrams. I, I think we literally casted him. Was it like two days before yeah. we went to camera? Yeah. It was and something. We, and the last person we saw for sure. Yeah, I remember like it was so hard to find someone you wouldn't think, but it really was hard to find someone to p- play Herb. And uh, the actor's name was Bobby Cole, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, he came in, Howard and I sat with him and he just like he just instantly like got the energy of Herb. Like we could just tell like, whoa, at least this guy is just going to bring the energy. And like, I don't even think we got to fully tell him everything that he was in for. Uh, but luckily <laughs> when we were on set, he was just so in for everything. And yep. like the farther we could go, the farther, like the more happier he was. And so he really embodied, I felt like the spirit of her. Oh baby. yeah. And, 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 and he, when he was covered in that baby oil, you know, he was slipping and sliding all over the place and, <laughs> he was, gotten hurt and you know, he had tripped and fell, you know, <laughs> and he was just, he was going for it, you know? So it was, it was pretty uh, spectacular. Yeah. Thank God we found him because honestly, well, it just, well, like, we know what the backup was. What? Oh, Evan has his backup. If he wants to share who, who was going to play Herb in his mind. Uh, if who? 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 Me. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course. How could I forget? <laughs> oh my God, that's ridiculous. But <laughs> yeah, there were definitely, yeah, there were some scenes like I, like it was so ridiculous to just like watch like a bunch of guys like standing around like a set trying to figure out like what were like the, the best way to for, like to have a sexual, uh, like a sex position that would feature the cowboy boots and work for the <laughs> shot yeah. and get the cocaine in the shot at the same time and like. It just, <laughs> oh, I, I can, it was a sight to see for sure. Evan, if you want to, I shared Evan photos I took of you guys acting out that sequence of trying to figure out what that would look like. So if Evan wants to share them, he can, but it's pretty, uh, it's, well, I think when, you've, uh, when you've worked together as much as Jason and I have, you can, you can, you can, you can get in any position and it'll be all right. <laughs> um, but what I was going to say is, um, uh, going back to the origin story of doing this episode, I mean, one of the main reasons that, you know, I was finally convinced to do it was the the reenactment potential of this episode. I mean, like, you know, that was kind of the thing that Sean Oliver had said was like, I mean, just imagine the reenactments, you know, and, and that definitely was a, 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 a main factor for us wanting to do this and, you know, do, having the challenge of doing it only because, you know, the last 24 hours of his life is, so wild and um you know and 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 for us i thought that when we did the reenactments we did kind of pull out a lot of tricks that i felt like were some of our best gags that we did in terms of all of the shoots that we've done um there was one particular shot that i just want to i just want to call out because i thought it was pretty cool was um it's actually two shots we use the same trick which is <clears throat> there's that little scene when um, all the like the like TV crew is about to like hang Herb over the edge of the balcony, you know, yeah. Uh, when they're like threatening him, you know, to pay, and um, that was just so cool because like that that scene we just didn't really know how we would shoot, and that was just literally us 
you know, putting up a railing, putting the camera up high and then putting Christmas lights on the floor to make them look like a city uh, down below and then just fill it full of smoke. And it kind of had that illusion of being up high over a balcony. And it really worked because, I mean, you just look at this is just a, a piece of railing and some Christmas lights. But, you know, you can use that to really sell that. And then, of course, the scene where, you know, Jason, you're playing McFoley and, you know, Herb invites, you know, you up to the suite to show you his boots. And and that whole scene was just, you know, decorating, you know, uh, Christmas lights literally through a window. Uh, uh, and, and yeah, it, it, when you when you go back and you look at it, it really looks like a skyline with, you know, buildings and everything. But it's just out of focus Christmas lights. So yeah. and that that was fun. Yeah. Like what I like, too, is like like UWF has this kind of like this aesthetic that we could like lean into just like. Even when you look at the ver- the belt itself, the like the television championship belt, where it's very colorful and it has like, you know, the letters are in like like yellow and green and purple, and so we like try to use those colors as like a color palette within the episode, um, and it and that's something we found too is like with a lot of like indie promotions, what we kind of like to dig into is like they all, they each have their own little like aesthetic flourishes that are really kind of fun to lean into a little bit. Like even, you know, with the new Jack episode and we introduce uh, that promoter MWW who has thunder wrestling that like just looking at all like the designs that they created for that one little indie promotion and the color palettes that they use for it. It's just really inspired. Like they might not have known how inspired those choices were, but we really appreciate them. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't. <laughs> um, can we talk about Beach Brawl for just a minute? Is everyone cool with that Absolutely. as a transition? So, <clears throat> you know, Beach Brawl being the actual first and only pay per view that, um, you know, Herb Abrams did is, is uh, such a fascinating part of the story because that's definitely the turning point, I feel like, for the company. Like, had that been a little bit more successful, there might be a different story to tell. Um, but, you know, as we know, it's one of the lowest performing pay-per-views, I think, of all time. Um, but one fact I just wanted to throw out there that was really fun is one of the best parts of making the show, which I don't think we've really talked about, is actually, or I should say one of the more fun parts is when we do the the actual voiceover narration with Chris Jericho is 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 really fun cuz you know the episode's finished and you know you know he's basically in the booth recording the narration and um he's actually recording it along with the video track so we actually get to see all the like the like scene that leads up to whatever line he's about to record and <clears throat> as soon as we got into the beach brawl portion of the UWF story when he was laying down the voiceover, he let this slip, which I thought was such a funny story, which is Chris Jericho and Lance Storm, you know, they're, they were buddies from going way back. They actually were such big wrestling fans at the time that they actually ordered the Beach Brawl pay-per-view. So they might have been like one of 100 people that actually ordered this thing. And he was talking about how um, when they got it, the like audio didn't work or something like in like in like in like the feed maybe they were getting it through some pirate situation or something i'm not sure but the audio didn't work so chris jericho and lance storm actually decided at that moment in time to record their own uh wrestling commentary to the whole beach brawl so somewhere out there presumably in lance storm's collection hopefully is a vhs tape with chris jericho and lance storm doing commentary on the beach brawl so that needs to be found um (laughs) <laughs> yeah, which is amazing. And then the other thing that's really funny is that the beach brawl took place at the Manatee Civic Center in Palmetto, Florida. And Chris also told us that the very first Nitro that he ever wrestled was at the Manatee Civic Center in Palmetto, Florida. And the funny thing is, is when he showed up to the to the actual Nitro, he, he, he just walks in and he just like takes it all in. And the, the only thing he's thinking is, wow. This is where the beach brawl was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is, which is amazing, you know. So that's just a fun little anecdote of the crossover of UWF and Chris Jericho. Well, let's put a bow on this one. Uh, there's so much research that goes into a show like this. Tell me what uh, what you wish could have made air that maybe didn't make air, Howard. Uh, honestly, I can go on for an hour about that. Uh, I'm going to do two quick things. 
Uh, one is the uh, Steve Ray, who uh, we've talked about a little bit. Um, he, when I kind of pre-interviewed, when I first reached out to him, he told me a longer version of the story that he tells about her jumping out the window, which this is all alleged, I have to say. It is alleged, but it is pretty <laughs> crazy. Um, full story is that Herb uh, contacted or got a, a, a contracted, sorry, a number of girls from uh, Heidi Fleiss in Los Angeles, the legendary madam. Um, and Herb and Steve were uh, to going to a golf tournament in Palm Springs that were they were the special guests of Kenny Baker, who you'll all know as R2-D2 from Star Wars. So it's Herb Abrams, Steve Ray. R2-D2, and a number of call girls at a golf tournament in Palm Springs. And that is the site of where Herb tried to get people to um, take a check, and they did not take the check, and goons allegedly were sent after him. So I do have to just interject that maybe not everyone knows, or maybe I'm just ignorant, that you know R2-D2, the actual droid itself, you know, was piloted by a little person with yeah. no legs. No, he had legs. He was oh, just a he had legs. person. I don't know where. Yeah. I guess I. I don't know what I'm talking about. Sorry, guys. He had legs. Go on. But yeah, so yeah, so Kenny Baker, the man who played R two D two, who passed a few years ago, uh, was involved in Herb Abrams. There's a, the weird amount of celebrities that you hear. Like, there's a story how Will, William Shatner went to his office once, and he knew him. Tiny Tim was another person. Just all these guys who got into Herb's orbit. And one of the guys who got into Herb's orbit that people probably don't know about is a man named Zoog's Rift. And Zoog's Rift was kind of a Frank Zappa sort of uh, experimental musician, um, and he really wanted to get into wrestling. And um, he kind of in the later era of the UWF got involved with Herb, and he was one of the people funding him for a little bit of time. Um, and there's a, an amazing video online. You can find it on YouTube, on archive.org. Um, I think it's called UWF Rampage. And it's from the show in North Dakota that uh, the legend is that Zoog's put it out and it's a mix of the actual show with like weird B-roll. Like the the tape starts with um, John Tolis, the re legendary wrestler and manager, uh, not realizing he's being filmed uh, and talking about all the lesbians in the crowd and how there's a ton of lesbians in North Dakota. Um <laughs> There's footage of a press conference where Herb is going off, where there's maybe eight people in the audience and most of them are children. There's Steve Ray on the back of a truck yelling at people. It's just like one of the weirdest things in wrestling that I've seen. And I, I just uh, I, I want to direct people to it because it's pretty outstanding. And then on top of it all, Zoog Rift's, Zoog's Rift son, Aaron, who I, I believe is a wrestling writer, he recently put out... Um, a video of YouTube of Zoogs talking about Herb and his experience. And in that video, he included a scan of a flyer for the event that they were trying to put on after the Blackjack Brawl, which never happened. And this is the first I ever heard about this. This was maybe two days ago. And one of the scheduled matches was a psycho aquatic torture match between <laughs> Cactus Jack and Sabu. Yeah, we actually asked Mick about that the other day, and he has no recollection of it. Um, oh. So I'm sure that was just another another con job. But um, but Mick Mick because because Mick I think by that point was having WWE conversations around '96, um, and this that's what he was telling us the other day. But yeah, it's just wild. I the just whole... want, like we have sorry we have a boneyard match. I want the psycho aquatic torture match. That's yeah. all I want. Seriously, tell Bruce. <laughs> My goodness. Well, this is uh, one for the ages, man. Maybe one of the more fun episodes. I hate that we're talking about an ending like this. That was fun, but I don't know another word to describe it. It just feels like nonstop craziness from the front to the back. Jason, uh, any other final words about this uh, rather unique character in the story of Dark Side of the Ring? Oh, gosh. You know, like Evan was saying before, you know, the, the story just keeps, you know, it just keeps building on like a snowball and it's uh i feel like there's still stories that will come out of the woodwork about herb abrams um and i i want to know more about that book that's being made as well too that's something i think a lot of us are going to want to get our hands on when that eventually comes out yeah i think that the 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 saga of the uwf could definitely be its own season of dark side of the ring um for sure i mean this this was just you know for us like you know, Gino Hernandez, that episode um, in season one, it's, it's a very similar experience where, 
you know, it's one of the stories that we didn't really know that much about when we went in. And going into this and like every week, every day, there felt like there was a new bizarro detail or some new crazy twist to the story or some wild perspective that we hadn't gotten. And and that that's really the most fun I think we have making the show is kind of looking at these more deeper cut you know, B side stories that we can really just go full force into. And I think that was what's really cool about seeing it last night was just, you know, people kind of discovering the story. And, you know, you, wrestling fans might not have known Herb Abrams before last night, but now they definitely will. And I think now that we've, you know, hopefully we can create some more Herb Abrams scholars out of last night's episode and we can get some more information uh, unearthed and some more some more firm, hard, confirmed details about the way he passed. Um, and, you know, and, and who knows? Or, or maybe someone will find that he's alive and we don't know what the <laughs> hell is going on in, in the first place. But... Um, definitely one of the more fun, wild experiences we had making the show. And, um, yeah, it was just, oh, before uh, and we go to, uh, Howard, I think people are going to want to know if there's any other info about Koki, the dog. Yes. Uh, oh, so one thing we cut from the episode, I can quickly say how Herb would bring Koki, he'd leave him in the limo when they would go to a steakhouse and then he would make them at the steakhouse, uh, make a steak for Koki and bring it out to the limo. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then the other great thing about Koki is he, um, so Herb's company was called NGK Productions, and uh, NGK apparently stood for, uh, I don't know what the N is, but uh, G was Gucci and K was Koki. They were all names of his dogs, and so in case he got sued, the uh, company would actually be in his dog's name. So that is my, my little Koki info. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. The company was in the dog's name. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i mean you just as soon as i found out that herb's dog's name was koki i felt like it really endeared me that true that was the one bit of info that that sold me on Herb. that'd be like well maybe i might have liked Herb, you know because that's funny that means he's self-aware a little bit right I don't know what it means, but it means that this is uh, <laughs> the best show on wrestling. I can't believe that we're, we've been blessed with this episode. Thank you guys for all your hard work. This is the only episode that I had to watch three times. Uh, <laughs> it's just such a phenomenal story. And I'm looking forward to next week. Evan, give everybody an idea of what we're in store for. That's right. Next week's episode is uh, all about the Road Warriors. Um, you know, <clears throat> this is one of the only episodes of the show where a wrestler sought us out and called us out. And uh, Animal found us uh, when when I was uh, at uh, Actual Starcast when I was there. Uh, Animal uh, really was a f big fan of the show, and he felt that you know he would love to tell the the, the real story of the Road Warriors. And um, that, and obviously, Jason and I have grown up, you know, as huge Road Warriors fans as kids. Yeah. I mean, you 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 honestly. I challenge you to find anything to show me anything that is cooler than the road warriors entrance in the mid eighties with iron man pumping and these guys coming out to the ring, jumping the ring with spikes. I mean, there isn't anything cooler than that. So it's you know, literally Jason, the greatest image. I think humankind has ever come up with. Like, literally, <laughs> yeah. Look at it. It's just so captivating. Um, yeah. And it always has like for Evan and I, we've got like all the action figures. I'm literally sitting here in a fucking road warriors hoodie right now like we're <laughs> just yeah they oh should be my. yeah they got to get the road warriors up in the space capsule you know for the aliens to find yeah. <laughs> um but you know for us it was a huge like uh you know since they were such a huge part of us growing up as kids and because there is such a fascinating story behind this tag team i mean it, this is kind of a story we wanted to look at in terms of like, you know, it's all about identity. You know, uh, when, when Hawk passed away, you know, it, it kind of left a lot for animal to reckon with, you know, and, and what his own identity was. And, uh, that was a really kind of compelling story for us, like to look at kind of fallen brotherhood and wrestling and, and, you know, really look at one of the most iconic tag teams in wrestling history. So it was a huge excuse to tell that story and it was also a huge excuse for Jason and I to get our own set of pads that we wore, and uh, and and we also uh, recreated the 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 uh, Starcade uh, steps, which I'm sure we'll talk about next week, yeah. um, which was a very important thing for us. 
And yeah, we just, this was a huge, like, you know, exploration and aesthetic for us because it's just such a huge part of us uh, when we were kids growing up loving wrestling. Are you guys hard right now? It feels like you guys are popping boners just talking about this episode next week. I I mean, fuck you'll yeah. definitely see we like fetishize the hell out of the Road Warriors. <laughs> yeah, I mean, remember we we talked about the chain videos, Conrad. Oh this no, is just, I know these all, are, I know all yeah. about the chain videos, and I know how excited you were at Starcast in Vegas when you got to throw the shoulder pads on. And yeah, listen, I'm excited to see it. I, I think everybody listening to this grew up as a fan of the Road Warriors, and next week. We get to explore the good, the bad, and the ugly of, uh, some pretty talented performers. Uh, one of which, uh, is no longer with us. So stay tuned. It's Tuesday night, 10 PM Eastern. I get it on my direct TV. I know it's on dish network. Be sure to check your local cable listings, but tune in next Wednesday. We're going to break down dark side of the ring. The road warriors edition right here on dark side of the podcast. You know, listen, every week I tell you that I can save you some money at savewithconrad.com, but I decided this week, let's do something a little different. Don't take my word for it. Let's read some five-star reviews that were just left this month for savewithconrad.com. Christopher in Indiana says the process was painless and easy, direct communication and quick responses to questions throughout the process. Honest advice put me in a position to save tons of money and pay off my mortgage quicker. Charles from Ohio Jimmy is what made it great. He answered every one of my stupid questions with patience and grace. Randa from Ohio. Awesome. Right from the start being out of state was no issue. First family made everything super easy and convenient. They were available before, during, and after business hours. I cannot say enough good things. Brian from Missouri. Everyone was terrific to deal with. Jimmy was very professional and super easy to deal with. He answered all of our questions promptly and accurately. I would recommend Jimmy to anyone. I know Michael from West Virginia. Everyone was professional and made the whole process easy. The entire process took a month and every step of the way, someone was available. When I had questions, just an awesome company, Thomas from Tennessee, Derek was great to work with and made the experience easy and always reliable, always available to answer questions. Neil from Florida, fast, friendly, knowledgeable. Randall from Ohio. Awesome. Right from the start being out of state was no issue. Steven from Ohio, simple, fast, no issues and blew my previous mortgage company out of the water with great customer service. And were always quick to get back to me whenever I had questions, Robert from Indiana, easy to keep in contact. I was able to use email and text messages for most of the deal, which made this very easy to get done. Five stars, John from Ohio. I love the texting and easy communication from this mortgage team. Closing was simple and awesome as well. Brendan from Arizona gave us five stars and said, great communication, great response times, just an overall great experience. Austin from Florida says huge listener of Conrad's podcast and everything he says is true. He can help you save money and take years off of your loan. Jimmy was great to work with amazingly painless experience compared to others I've had. Thank you very much. And no, I should be thanking you guys. First of all, thanks for listening to the podcast. And second, thanks for trusting me enough to have a shot at saving you some money. But most of all, thank you for your business. And I hope you enjoy all of the savings that we provided for your family. But if you're listening to this and you haven't gone to save with Conrad.com yet, what are you waiting for? We're licensed in more than 40 states. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. And if we can't help you save money, we won't waste your time. But if you've got a 30 year loan, if you've got a second mortgage, if you've got credit card debt, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not realize it. We're going to show you how to get the best interest rate possible and skip a couple of house payments. But in the process, you're going to save hundreds of dollars per month. And more importantly, pay your house off faster with cheaper monthly payments. If you're serious about keeping more of your own money and getting out of debt faster, retiring on time and eliminating your credit card debt, you should hurry to save with Conrad.com. Find out how much money you can save for free right now. NMLS number 65084 equal housing lender. Save with Conrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at Save with Conrad.com.